I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, October 24, 2017. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Anya McCagg and Grace Hardiman, Towson University students. Uh, we will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no additions or changes. <coughs> Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right, the uh, agenda stands as presented. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Of course, if there's less than 10 in the box, all of those who signed up will speak. Ms. Schaefer, our student member, will pull out the cards, and Mr. Virch will read the names. Diana Bergman. Sharon Saroff. Bosch Ferrone. Mohammed Jamil, or Jamiz. Lily Lee. Denise Rucker. Brenda Pfeiffer. Thank you all. Our next, <coughs> excuse me, our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the <coughs> superintendent. Uh, while we encourage public, public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. Uh, I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Uh, please conclude your, marks when re your remarks when you hear the bell or see that your time has expired. Um, I now call on our <coughs> advisory and stakeholder group um, uh, members to speak. And the first is TABCO's representative, Abby Baton. <coughs> Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, and members of the board. Later this evening, you will be receiving a report on school climate, school behavior, and discipline. While some of the information from the surveys is enlightening, some issues were not captured in that survey. We did a survey of our members for our bargaining team. We were trying to determine the main issues our teachers perceived to be problematic and where they wanted us to have language added to our master agreement to address these issues in our upcoming negotiations. The top issue was workload and tied to that issue were three issues surrounding it, discipline, curriculum, and technology. At TABCO, almost weekly, we hear about teachers getting hurt on the job by a student. One of my board members re just recently had her finger um, purposely broken by an elementary school uh, 
student. Another teacher on my board a few years ago was hurt when high school kids were fighting and pushed her. She ended up with bruises and downtime because of her injuries. These incidents are happening all over at every level. Some of the teachers never make a formal report because they don't want their, to get their students in trouble. We have asked BCPS for data about teachers being hurt by students, but we only get mass data, which includes falling off a chair or other accidents, along with teachers being hurt by students. We can't tell which data is which because it is not reported that way. We would like to see the actual data about students hurting teachers, students hurting other students, and students hurting adults. That information would go a long way in helping the system understand what is happening in our schools and hopefully address it. The school climate report speaks to restorative justice and climate prevention, culture, and logical consequences. We agree with these ideas. However, the problems will remain until we have enough supports in place. Without the needed extra supports for smaller class sizes, school counselors, school psychologists, crisis interventionists, special educators, and the list can go on and on. We can only see more work on the backs of teachers, more problematic behavior, more of the same. Restorative, where will we find the time and resources for professional professional development and restorative practices. Restorative practice takes time to learn and, and time to implement. Where will teachers find the time to keep the mountain of data this will require to make sure everyone is doing their work with fidelity? We agree with the need for much of the information in this report, but without the supports in place to make the work doable, we have grave concerns with <coughs> this will continue to be just another initiative without the proper resources in place to make it workable and without adding even more to the unbelievable workload our teachers face today. If this truly is a priority, these supports must be included in the budget. The teachers are fighting for the Kerwin Commission funding. This Board of Education needs to be fighting alongside us to make sure all voices are heard so that our budget requests can be funded. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee is P.J. Schaefer. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, members of the board. Uh, I'm P.J. Schaefer. I'm the past chair of the CCAC and a parent of a student at Newtown. Uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of CCAC's support of the special ed uh, um, staffing plan. It's one of our work sessions. Um, we reviewed the special ed, Office of Special Ed um, recommendations in the, in the upcoming staffing plan. And the number one need that we saw was for ABA th um, licensed board certified behavior analysts. Now, um, I started lobbying this board five years ago when I was the chair of CCAC and there were no BCBAs on, on BCPS staff. Um, today, now there are three. Uh, BCB, uh, BCBAs are the number one um, treater of autism because they're providing ABA therapy, which is the leading form of autism therapy. Right now, the number of uh, students that can be seen under the guidelines that govern BCBAs uh, is somewhere between 10 to 15 students per case load. Um, right now, with three BCBAs and BCPS staff, do the math, that's about 45 students. There are well over 1,000 students with autism here in Baltimore County. Um, and certainly, if you just do the math, the studies say that these students should, some of them should be getting up to 20 hours of ABA per week. Um, cer certainly that can't happen with the number of staff currently on, on BCPS roster. The number of BCBAs on staff also can help supervise other staff members providing service and provide training. Um, however, again, they are limited under Comar as to how many um, people they can supervise, as well as the pe persons that they're supervising must also be accredited and have the proper skills to, to do so. We therefore ask that, uh, a CCAC asks that uh, this board support the request to hire more licensed BCBAs um, for Baltimore County Public Schools to support the students with special needs throughout the system. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker from the PTA Council of Baltimore County is Jane Lee.
Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, board members. I'm sure you figured out by now I never write a speech. Um, this week it was impossible between the Kerwin Commission <coughs> PTA meetings and spent the weekend in 12 hours of national PTA board training, some of which I wrote and had to have presented to me, mm. and a board <laughs> meeting. Um, one of the things that we are most concerned about is the lack of support staff. Um, it's interesting that Abby brought that up just when we are. Um, we need more school counselors and we need more school psychologists and support staff, especially with the growing number of behavior problems, discipline problems, and the school climate. It's definitely necessary. We also still want to point out that we believe that part of the problem is that children are not learning how to react to other people and learn interpersonal relationships, possibly because of too much screen time. I am surprised that the school calendar wasn't on tonight's agenda. I came expecting to hear about it, and I look forward to what the solution and the outcome of that will be, and perhaps giving some more input. Um, we also are concerned about equitable facilities for all of our children. When I hear parents telling me about the brown and yellow water in their school, running out of bottled water, being told by principals that the water's tested fine, but nobody to this point has given me any of the numbers that I've asked for, for the test results of that water. Um, we do need that, parents want it. They come to me and I have to say I don't have it and it's not on the website anywhere that I can find. We also are concerned about unsound buildings. Um, you know, you've got a school that may be falling into a giant sinkhole and all the money in the world is not gonna fix that. Even if you fix the building inside, it may still slide away. And I again ask for the superintendent to please meet with us. There are some things that would be better accomplished in a two-way conversation. If I want to talk to myself, I can do that at home with my children watching television and playing on their computers. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. That's Lila Marinbloom. Good evening, Superintendent White, Chairman Gillis, and the Board of Ed. I'm Lila Marenbloom, President of the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. There are many ways to define the word support, a few being prop up, sustain, maintain, and keep up. This is exactly what over 900 classroom paras do every day in our classrooms. We support our students' learning and teachers' teaching. Today, most of our students are using a tablet or device to facilitate their learning. These tablets contain educational materials, assignments, and readings. However, it was decided that issuing tablets to classroom paraeducators would not be in the best interest of education. I am asking that this concept be changed. My members working in the classroom are now at a disadvantage. They do not have access to tablets, nor were they trained to use them. How can a paraeducator help a student under these conditions? Not issuing tablets to paraeducators places an additional burden upon the teacher. The student must now wait for the teacher whenever they have a problem, whether it is using the tablet or understanding the assignment on the tablet. This once again impacts the ability of the student to work at their own pace, which is the justification for using the device. And what about my members? Not being able to help a student overcome a minor device operational issue so that they can start on the lesson is not only demoralizing to the para, but to that student, his or her classmates, and the teacher. Paraeducators are here to help, and being a place in a situation where that is not possible is simply unfair. <coughs> Students seeing that the paraeducator can't help them, it, re this results in it lowering their respect for themselves, for needing help, 
and for the paraeducator who due to not having a device can't help. I'm asking that these devices be made available to all classroom paras along with the professional development necessary to help us operate them. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda are public comments and our first speaker is Diana Bergman. Good afternoon, everybody. As you know, I had a really rough week last week. And I just want to say, as a parent, Ms. White, I'm sorry. I really felt that our BCPS team at the Board of Public Works didn't visually come out and look as a team. I saw you standing on the podium on your own, and you held your ground. And I saw Kevin Smith stand right by side you. I was there since 10 in the morning, and I watched every school district in the state of Maryland go up together as one group, as one group. Guys, please don't ever do that again. We are one team, one BCPS team. I have a bone to pick with Baltimore County government. They've predicted that this board will make a decision for a renovation for the Lansdowne community. This board has a responsibility to do right for every single child in BCPS. And the prediction of that vote will not be decided by somebody else that's not on the board. It will be decided by this board. And our board representative, he's not here today, he's with his family, and he deserves every minute of his volunteer time to spend time to his family. But I ask for you guys to please wait for him to make that decision to represent our community. Because our question has changed. The question for the Lansdowne community is no longer renovation versus new building. The question has changed. The new question is, when will Lansdowne get a new building? Because the eight little communities that make up Lansdowne deserve the same thing as any other child that lives in a wealthier part of this pocket of this county. So please, I've invited you all to please Come to the high school and tour it. If you haven't come, thank you, Ms. June, because I know you came recently. If you came almost three years ago, I need you to come back and visit. I need you to come back, visit. See what it's really like. We have individuals that are scared to come into my community. I could introduce you to parents in Baltimore Highlands, in Highland Village, in Friendship Gardens, in Riverview, in Arbutus, in Lansdowne, in Hailthorpe. That make the whole community of Lansdowne. So please represent my community, how it should be represented there's no reason for us to live in the most richest state in the United States to have any building condition like this. Thank you, Ms. Bourbon. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, members of the board, Superintendent White. I don't know how many of you watched the proceedings at the Public Works Board meeting last week. I know that Kathy Causey, and I appreciate her staying for public comment, was there. My son and I testified to get money for a new building for Lansdowne, and I feel 
like this board and the county government is pitting communities against one another when we should be treated equally. The condition of a school building impacts very negatively or positively, depending on that condition, to school climate, student behavior. Would you want your child to try to learn in a classroom that isn't big enough for 26 students and there are 30 in there? and there's no air conditioning, and the fan isn't enough. That's the kind of conditions in the classrooms at Lansdowne High School. Would you like your child to be in a building that is crumbling and sinking into the ground? My son and I are afraid that it's going to take a classroom falling on top of another classroom and students getting killed before we do something about this. It is not just a matter of equity, it is a matter of safety. It is a matter of having equality for all students to have an education, a free and appropriate public education. Right now, if I was a child in a wheelchair, I couldn't go to Lansdowne High School. And I know of at least one student last year who didn't have a disability, but he happened to break his leg. And he had to be transferred to Catonsville for an entire year because he did not have access to his zone school where he wanted to go. This is not a contest. I know you want to build a building for Delaney. Give us one, too. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron. Dr. Ferron. Good evening to all. Good evening. What's common between Lansdowne issue and the Muslim holidays is that both don't have Senator Zirkin coming for support, don't have the BJC supportive of them. And it is all about equity and equality. That's what you always talk about. It's about teaching students a good purpose when they grow up and they become executives. Everybody knows that the Jewish holidays closed because the superintendent was Jewish and the teachers at the time boycotted the schools and encouraged their friends who are not religious and not really Jewish to boycott the school. So they created a problem. And then unfortunately in the Houston era, the impression is that the Jewish holidays are Komar holidays, which is absolutely incorrect. So we know that the closure on the Jewish holidays is not for an objective reason. It's not for a secular reason. It's not for something verifiable. And we know statistics-wise that there are as many Muslims as Jewish residents in Baltimore County. There are many Muslims that don't really show their identity, so the numbers would look lower. Just remember the Jewish people around and before the Second World War would not really venture to say what their religion is. So you have a choice. My proposal to you is to make an improved option B. Close also on Eid al-Fatr, and if applicable on Eid al-Adha, equal to the Jewish holidays. That would be option B plus improved. You have a choice next time around, either to talk about equity and equality or implement it. You have a choice to be objective 
or to be arbitrary. You have a choice to respond to the political pressures of senators and political organizations just behind me, or really to listen to the people who came and made you 800 plus petition and came here in the hundreds over the past 14 years. Why do you ask for counts on Muslims when we came for 14 years? I have been involved for 20 years since Dr. Berger was in here. And you don't ask for counts for the Jewish population. You just accept that Senator Zirkin says 1,000 emails. You just accept what the BJC really provide you. So we can teach our students the ideals, or we can continue the discrimination of the past 20 years. I really hope that you would do what's right. Option B, improve. As I Thank you, Dr. Farron. Thank you. Our next speaker is Muhammad Jamil. Peace and good evening, Chair Segillis, Superintendent Ms. White and esteemed board members. Today is the 79th time to speak before the board. I've lost the count the number of times that I've been present. Thousands of community members representing the citizens who happen to be Muslims have also appeared here. Our children, first and second generations, have also presented their difficulties and described the discrimination that they experienced. These are not just statistics and numbers. Real lives matter. Our future matters. Our country's future matters. Our children are the future. An increase in number of hate groups and hate incidents has been increasing as I described at last time. Such trajectory of increase is unsustainable before the society will break down. It is our duty for the sake of our country to reverse this dangerous trend. Educators and educators only can set the goalpost or remove it altogether. Children's behavior is a learned behavior. It would be unwise to consider money in the equation to achieve the justice. Our children are stressed out ever since the decision under Dr. Stuart Berger was made. It is accelerated by their knowledge that they have been singled out, alienated, and marginalized, and discriminated only because they happen to be Muslims. Failure to rectify such policy can only breed contempt and hate. Once again, I want to reiterate for the umpteenth time, that there never ever was a barometer used to establish a criteria in 19 or around 1998. Yet, various reasons and justifications are put out to reject the closing of the schools on Muslim holidays. Students are customers of BCPS. It is about them and not about its employees. I've been a businessman, and many business persons or employers will tell you that they are there to cater their customer and meet the needs of the customer. Employees have to be reminded constantly that their customer <coughs> is the priority. Their customer must be satisfied, and the customer always comes first, and the customer is always right. Also, once again, we are requesting equal treatment, not statistics, but justice. No special privileges or exceptions. So please add the Muslim holidays into the calendar. God bless you all, and thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lily Lee. Members, 
My topic today is very simple, but very powerful from my heart. It's called, please support and keep our hero bus driver, Miss Tom. I'm speaking today as a regular mom and regular citizen. I just want to say, please keep our hero bus driver, Miss Tom. I didn't know Miss Tom, and my kids didn't ride Miss Tom's bus. But once I saw Miss Tom in the news, and how his bravery and quick thinking saved our kids. I immediately had the natural moms intuited. This is a hero. Mm. This is our hero bus driver. <laughs> if I were Mr. Tom, I would have done exactly the same thing. Do not open the door and move to police station to protect all the kids in the bus. Because by all the wit, that was exactly the safest thing to do at that emergency situation. Baltimore County Public Schools need good bus drivers. For the pay our bus drivers are getting, it's very difficult to retain them. As the working condition, responsibility, and the liability are way, way more mounting than people working in the office. And also, we all know that there are a lot of crazy people in this world, which makes the job of our bus drivers very difficult. Please support, keep, and reward our hero bus driver, Miss Tom. If we don't support their caring and love for our kids, then we are letting other bus drivers down. They are watching. Then, Baltimore County Public School will not have good bus drivers anymore. Think about it. If I were the bus driver, and I tried my best in that kind of scenario to protect all the kids in my bus. And if I am let go afterwards, who else would like to protect our kids next time? Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Denise Rucker. Thank you for your time and my allowance to speak. Greetings to each and every one of you in your proper places. Um, so I'm just gonna get right into it. So as parents, we need to make a real effort to be engaged in our children's lives, to listen to them and be there for them when they need us. We need to be involved in their schools and in their activities so that we know that they're what they're up to, both in and out of the classroom. And when something is wrong, we need to speak up and we need to take action. This was a quote from First Lady Michelle Obama at the White House Conference on Bullying Prevention in March, March 10th, 2011. My name is Denise Rucker. I am a parent of a child who attends a Baltimore County Public School. I am standing in on the behalf of all parents who have been advocates for their child's safety <coughs> in school. Um, who have been victims, along with their child, of bullying, harassment, and intimidation. I would like to thank um, Dr. I mean Mrs. White, I'm sorry, um, Superintendent Mrs. White for affording me this opportunity to speak of my concerns. I also would like to acknowledge and show my appreciation for your diligence um, to address and resolve the issue of bullying in Baltimore County Public Schools, um, the establishment of the anti-bully initiative that has been termed in Maryland as the bullying, harassment, or intimidation policy that also covers cyberbullying um, that was established March 31st, 2010. Um, so I'm speaking of this because um, I am a parent who is concerned about all of the things that have been going on. I'm also a peer specialist by um, profession, but I have a stack here because I, I can't read all. But it's only about two pages, and then I included some things, but I would like to give each and every one of you one a copy. Um, but I wanted to speak um, on my concern of um, all the things that are taking place in Baltimore County Public Schools concerning bullying and intimidation. I feel that there is a need for um, enforcement um, of this policy. I think that we need people in place um, who are going to actually implement the tools that have been set in place by um, Dr. Dance. Um, there is a BHI report for Maryland, a reporting form, investigating form, intimidation resources. It's so many resources that have been put out um, that I've experienced personally um, in the last three years that have not been implemented in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, 
the ones that my son has attended in any way. Um, I have um, seen a lot of uh, higher rate in suicide um, in the young people around 10, 11, 12 years old that are committing suicide, and it's because of the bullying there. Um, a lot of it that's happening at the school, inside of the school building. So I have a miniature proposal, a very small proposal um, that I would love for you guys to take a look at. And I'll have all my information in here if you'd like to get in touch with me because I'm one that doesn't just like to you know, present problems, but I like solutions. I'm uh, willing to do the job <laughs> if need be. So if you can, I'm going to have to take one. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brenda. Pfeiffer. Good evening. Um, since the STAT initiative was first introduced in BCPS, there's been a lot of talk about the opportunity cost of the program, uh, referring to the high cost of STAT compared to the many needs in the school system that we can't afford to meet because we've chosen to pay for STAT instead. However, tonight I'd like to focus on a different cost of sorts. Uh, the loss of instructional time due to technology problems. While devices are being introduced with the hope of transforming instruction, these very devices often seem to be getting in the way of instruction instead. Consider the following examples, and please note these are real examples that happened either to my children or to people that I've spoken to. During a lesson, the technology is not working and the teacher can't access a needed resource and must spend time trying to get it to work. Students are using their devices to access non-instructional content rather than for the classwork or homework that they're supposed to be doing. A student's device is malfunctioning and the student cannot complete the lesson along with the rest of the class. A student has to leave class time to bring a malfunctioning device to on-site support, on tech support and therefore missing some portion of class time and having to catch up later. Tech problems occur during MAP or PARC testing, causing delays and requiring teachers to set aside even more time than planned to complete the testing. And this is something I've heard multiple times from my own children. Now problems like these are taking away from instructional time on a very regular basis, and the number of issues with the malfunctioning devices is pretty remarkable. Broken keyboards, either not functioning or missing keys, uh, programs that won't save so students lose their work and have to redo it, that happened to my daughter last year. Difficulty connecting to the internet at school or at home. Problems accessing needed websites or resources, including accessing BCPS1. Devices that overheat and shut down. Cameras that aren't operational. These are just a few examples that scratch the surface of a long list of problems with devices. And there's often lag time in getting repairs done to the devices. And many times the repair fixes one thing, but then another thing goes wrong. Loaners or trades for a new device aren't always available, and if they are, they're often not new devices, but just another device that someone else had a problem with and handed in. So the student just trades in one device with issues for another device with separate issues. This also happened to my daughter last year. I think that everyone in this room tonight would agree that technology certainly has a role to play in education. However, I urge BCPS to find a way to objectively measure the amount of instructional time being lost due to technical problems. As a school system, you must consider anything that may be taking away time from instruction in order to maximize learning for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item F, personnel matters, and I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, and resignations. I have a motion to approve the personnel matters presented in exhibits F1 and 2. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Very good. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda, item G, action taken in closed session. I invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered four appeals regarding confidential employee and student matters. I'm sorry, all they were all student matters in their um, in your quasi-judicial capacity. One was an oral argument where the board heard from uh, the parties. Three were considered on the record as no request for oral argument was made. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm those actions taken in closed session in the matters which were hearing examiner 18-10 was the <coughs> oral argument. 
summary affirmances were 18-01, 18-12, and 18-16. All right. Um, uh, I'll ask for if we can do these all at once. Um, <coughs> is there one that anyone needs to segregate? The oral argument matter for me is. All right. So let's do the oral argument first. Um, uh, do I have a motion to approve um, the item 1810, the decision made by the board in closed session? So moved. All right. Um, second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right. All right. And is there an abstention? Well, just not a vote. Okay. Not a vote. I'm opposed. Okay. Opposed. Very good. Also opposed. Okay. Uh, that, that carries. Um, 1801, 1812, and 1816 um, are now before you. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on those three items? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. The motion uh, on those three carries. Thank you. Okay. Next on our agenda is item H. And it is a report on policies, and for that I invite Mr. Virch to proceed. Mr. Chair and board members, the Policy Review Committee, in its advisory role, offers to propose policies 3130, 3520, 3532, 5410, and 7250 uh, policies which were looked at as part of the mandated five-year policy cycle, uh, as well as the deletion of policy 3510 to our full board for consideration as to whether to advance these proposed policies to second reader. BCPS uh, staff are present. Should any of our board members have any questions related to uh, the policies I've just enumerated? Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the board's policy review committee? So moved. All right, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that motion carries as well. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to separate out proposed policy 7250 because in committee I did not vote to move that one forward. All right. Do um, you wish to vote no on, on 7250? Yes. Very good. It'll be recognized. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Next on our agenda is item I, and that's a work session report on school climate, school behavior, and discipline. And uh, before I ask Ms. White to um, comment, I'll ask Drs. Boswell, McComas, Adams, and Whitstead to come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as staff comes forward, I just wanted to um, say thank you for this opportunity to provide uh, information on school climate, behavior, and discipline in Baltimore County Public Schools. We know that this is a subject of interest to many of our community members, our parents, uh, and teachers and administrators as well. And so this is in alignment with what was discussed also at, our, at your board retreat this summer and information that had been requested. And so this is an opportunity, again, uh, for transparency and for uh, the public to have um, detailed information on where we are with school climate overall. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Dr. McComas to get us started. Once we get the PowerPoint loaded. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There we go. Good evening, Mr. Gillis, Chairman Gillis, members of the board, and Superintendent White. Um, as uh, Chairman Gillis introduced us, I'm, I'm Mary Nicomas, and I'm the Chief Academic Officer for Baltimore County, and I'm joined this evening by Dr. Adams, Dr. Whitstead, and Dr. Marchand. Uh, we're here this evening to share a report on school climate, student behavior, and discipline. And our intent is to build greater understanding Can we get point of order, Mr. Chairman, when they have a, yeah. an audio Can we get issue. That microphone working? <laughs> yeah. Now it's ready. Dr. McComas, you can 
You can keep. I'm going to jump in. Just our intent, <laughs> our intent tonight is to grow some, uh, to to really build understanding for our members of our board and our stakeholders around the what, why, and how of school climate, student behavior, and discipline within Baltimore County schools. And so this evening, the topics that will be covered as part of um, our report will include uh, state and local BCPS policies that guide our daily work in schools, current BCPS data, including survey, uh, stakeholder survey data as well as suspension data, as, uh, along with our BCPS framework for climate. Before you is the BCPS framework for climate, and as our superintendent has emphasized, in BCPS, our framework for climate addresses three major components that support one another in creating and maintaining a positive school climate. One component is prevention, and prevention includes supports and strategies that are proactive and intended to help students make better choices, or excuse me, make good choices in the first place, and to learn how to interact uh, positively with their peers and adults. Another component is restoration. Restoration includes supports and strategies that help students and staff repair relationships, process events, and debrief incidents in those cases where student choices have not been ideal. And a third component is logical consequences. Logical consequences include a menu of reasonable res responses to student behaviors, which hold students accountable for their choices, while at the same time helping them to learn how to make different decisions when faced with similar situations in the future. This framework is conceptual and is symbolic of the ongoing interplay of prevention, restoration, and logical consequences within a school building that help both adults and students build and sustain a positive and productive community. We recognize that school climate is a direct reflection of the social emotional systems of support that are consistently available to students and faculty. Beginning in the 2014-2015 school year, local boards of education had the responsibility to adopt policies to create safe schools. And at a minimum, these policies must include a philosophy of fostering and teaching positive behavior to students. They must be designed to keep students connected to school. They must be, excuse me, they must describe the conduct that may lead to an in or an out of school suspension for a student. They must allow for discretion in imposing discipline in contrast to previous zero tolerance practices. They must address ways educational and counseling needs will be met for students. And they must explain why and how long-term suspensions are and exclusions are a last resort. COMAR further requires MSDE to develop a method to analyze the impact of disproportionality on minority students and students with disability. So let's take a minute and talk about what exactly is disproportionality. Disproportionate representation or disproportionality refers to the over or under representation of a given, given student group, often identified, excuse me, often defined by racial or ethnic backgrounds, but can also be defined by socioeconomic status, national origin, English language proficiency, gender, and sexual orientation in any specific category. A child's race and ethnic ethnicity significantly influence a child's probability of being misidentified, misclassified, and inappropriately placed in either special education programs and or suspended or expelled. School systems that are identified as disproportionate must provide to MSDE a plan to reduce disproportionality within one year and to eliminate it within three years. BCPS Policy 0100 on Equity outlines the Board of Education's belief that every student in the school system should receive an education that maximizes his or her potential to become a globally competitive graduate. The Board is committed to the success of every student in every school, and raising achievement for all students and closing achievement gaps among all students are top priorities for our Board. It further stresses that disparities on the bi basis of race, special education status, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, including gender expression, English language learners status or socioeconomic status are unacceptable and directly at odds with the belief that all students can achieve. 
And while complex societal and historical factors contribute to the inequities our students face, rather than perpetuating those disparities, the school system must address and overcome inequity by providing students with the opportunity <coughs> to succeed. And therefore, in response to MSDE regulations, BCPS policy 5560 outlined the following adjustments to disciplinary practices within BCPS. It decreased the length of suspensions. It ensured that suspensions and expulsions included educational services to students. It allowed and promoted administrative discretion with disciplinary actions. And it drove revisions to the student handbook. One of the ways we can understand perceptions of safety and security in BCPS is via the results of our annual stakeholder survey. In 2017, the survey reached over 81,000 responses, including 61,000 students in grades four through 12, over 10,000 parents or caregivers, 9,500 BCPS staff, of which 7,800 were school staff, excluding administrators who are reported separately. Finally, there were also 713 community members. In regards to safety and security, the following overall trends emerge. Elementary students feel safer at school by a meaningful margin compared to middle and high school students. Parents, school-based staff, school administrators, and central office staff had high perceptions of safety that mirrored those of elementary students. Students perceive bullying to be a problem at higher levels than adults answering the survey. In middle school, over half of student respondents indicate that bullying is a problem. On the following slides, we will share information related to specific survey questions which touch on climate and safety in BCPS. We will answer the what. What do our data say and show us? <coughs> this slide shows student perceptions of safety. For these slides, the percentages noted represent the percent agreement with the statement listed on each slide. 86.4% of students at the elementary level feel safe. 70% of middle school students and 71.6% of high school students feel safe. In terms of mutual respect, student to student, elementary students agreed more that students respect each other. 76.2% of students at the elementary level agree that students respect each other at school. 35.1% of middle school students and 41.3% of high school students agreed with this statement. Acceptance of others and their inherent differences is a critical foundation in developing and maintaining a positive school climate. Here, student perceptions of student acceptance varies by level of school. 76.2% of elementary students agree that most students in their school are accepting of other students. 55.1% excuse me, of middle school and 60.1% of high school students also agreed with this statement. Conflict resolution is an important skill. Students learn as they mature and are taught explicitly how to be better at engaging in and resolving disagreement with peers. More elementary school students perceive that students talk out their disagreements than do secondary students. Nearly 60% of elementary students agree that most students in their school try to work out their disagreements with other students by talking to them. 37.2% of middle and 39.3% of high school students agreed with this statement. Students were also asked to agree with the statement, most students stop and think before doing anything when they get angry. This question allows further insight into student perception as to how adept their peers are at thinking through and making good choices when faced with situations that anger or upset them. 45.1% of elementary school students reported that most students in their school stop and think before doing anything when they get angry. 25.5% of middle school students and 31.4% of high school students agreed with this statement. When school climate is positive and healthy, individuals within the school, including students, feel welcome and at home. Overall, students' perceptions of how welcoming their schools were are positive. Again, there are perceptual differences between levels of school. More elementary students feel more welcome in school than do secondary students. Specifically, 85.3% of elementary students feel welcome at their school, while 73.8% of middle school students and 74.7% of high school students feel welcome at school. As you are aware, safety at school and work is a Blueprint 2.0 performance metric. This chart shows the safety perceptions of all stakeholder survey respondent groups. Students were asked, I feel safe at school. 
Staff were asked, I feel safe and secure at work. Parents were asked, this school is safe and secure. Community members were asked, BCPS schools are safe. In examining these data, there is a gap between the percentage of elementary and secondary students who feel safe at school. Parents and BCPS staff had percentages that were similar to elementary students, and those of community members were the lowest. Finally, in terms of our stakeholder survey data, bullying is a topic that is presented on the survey. Respondents are asked to agree or disagree with the statement, bullying is a problem at this school. More students than adult re adults excuse me, reported that bullying is a problem at school. More than half of middle school students agreed that bullying is a problem in their school with elementary and high school agreement above 40%. School administrators expressed the least agreement that bullying is a problem. In considering the difference between student and adult perceptions of bullying, we believe that this difference may be due in part to the differences between what students perceive occurs to them and the outcome of the administrator's due process investigations. <coughs> that is, when students believe they have been bullied, bullied, they should and can report those instances. We encourage that. We want to honor that students are not feeling comfortable at school. Administrators are then required to investigate those instances, gathering evidence and holding the acquired evidence up to the standard of the definition of bullying as outlined in the student manual and rule 5580 form A. In the manual and on the form, bullying is defined as a pattern of behavior when a person repeatedly uses power in an intentional manner, including verbal, physical, or written conduct, or intentional electronic communication against one or more students. Not all reported allegations of bullying are found to reach this standard or definition. So this apparent disconnect may be the difference in students expressing, this is what I'm experiencing, versus administrators considering, this are, these are the results of my investigations, this, these are the results of my investigations when presented with the statement, bullying is a problem at this school. Earlier, Dr. McComas described disproportionality and the state's plan to identify and target for support and improvement those school districts that are deemed to be disproportionate based on their disciplinary data. As, dis as disproportionality is analyzed along factors such as race, ethnicity, and special education status, contextualizing the demographic composition of BCPS is critical in understanding our current level of disproportionality. On the following slides, we will present BCPS demographic and suspension data. Three main ideas contained in the following slides are as follows. The demographic composition of BCPS student enrollment has changed. Research into national trends and suspension shows that students of color, particularly African American students, are three times as likely as their white peers to be suspended. And finally, BCPS suspension data are consistent with these national trends and the body of research. Student demographics in BCPS have shifted dramatically over the last 33 years. The charts before you show the shifts in student enrollment by race and ethnicity between the 1983-84 school year and the 2016-17 school year. In 1984, just 17% of BCPS students were students of color. In 2007, nearly 60% of all BCPS students were students of color and the percentage of African American and white students was nearly identical. In examining our current student enrollment data for the 2017-2018 school year, we see that for the first time, there are more African American students enrolled in BCPS than there are white students enrolled. BCPS has become a school system where the majority of students are students of color. As our enrollment over time has reflected a more diverse student population, it has also reflected an increasing percentage of students living in poverty. As we know, students living in poverty often enter school with greater needs. This slide shows a comparison of the percentage of BCPS students living in poverty in 1998 and in 2017. Those percentages are represented in blue. Data prior to 1998 were not available. Currently, 45% of BCPS students are living in poverty as compared to 27% in 1998. This represents an increase from a little more than 22,000 students in 1998 to nearly 50,000 students during the 2016-2017 school year. This increase in the number of students living in poverty represents a 119% increase over this time period. For context, 
the number of students living in poverty in BCPS is slightly less than the total student enrollment of Howard County Public Schools. Now that we've shared the context of the demographic shifts in terms of race, ethnicity, and poverty, we will share BCPS suspension data. During the 2016-2017 school year, there were a total of 9,783 suspension incidents. This represents an increase from 8,445 incidents during the 2015-16 school year and 7,615 incidents during the 14-15 school year. It should be noted that 84% of all suspension incidents occurred in secondary schools. As you may be aware, the student handbook outlines, among other things, disciplinary actions that can be taken based on student behaviors. There are times when the logical consequences imposed on students based on their choices include long-term suspensions. Those cases are heard by the superintendent's designees. In the student handbook, student behaviors are grouped by category. Category one offenses are disruptive acts of misconduct as determined by school staff. Category two offenses are more serious acts of misconduct as determined by school administrators. Finally, category three offenses are the most serious acts of misconduct as determined by a school administrator. The, the current slide shows data for some category two and category three offenses. Disruptive behavior and physical attack on a student are category two offenses, while possession of a controlled subject, substance, excuse me, striking a staff member who is intervening in a fight either intentionally or unintentionally, and possession and use of a real weapon are category three offenses. The acts of misconduct noted on the chart before you represent the top five categories of board suspension over the three years from 2014-15 to 2016-17 as was the trend with suspension incidents overall, the number of board suspensions has increased across all shown categories since 2014-2015. One of the ways we can examine disproportionality in discipline is by contrasting student groups as a proportion of overall system enrollment and as a proportion of overall suspensions. The chart before you makes that contrast. Enrollment percentages are shown in orange while suspension percentages are shown in yellow. When things are not disproportionate, suspension proportions mirror enrollment proportions. These similar proportions are currently found only with our multiracial and English language learner student groups. More specifically, black or African American students represent 39% of enrolled students and represent 66% of all suspensions. Likewise, farm students represent 45% of enrollment and 68% of suspensions. Lastly, students with disabilities represent 12% of BCPS enrollment and 25% of suspensions. A second way we can understand disproportionality is by comparing the suspension rates of groups of students. The suspension rate is the count of students within a group who were suspended divided by the count of students within the group who were enrolled. As is shown on this chart and consistent with national trends, African American students in BCPS are suspended at three times the rate of their white peers, 9.3% compared to 2.9%. Farm students, our students living in poverty, are suspended at two and a half times the rate of students not living in poverty, 8.3% compared to 3.2%. And finally, students with disabilities are suspended at two and a half times the rate of their non-disabled general education peers, 11.7% compared to 4.6%. When we show suspension and enrollment patterns by race and service provision, it can be easy to forget that within student categorical groups like farms and special education, students of many races and ethnicities are represented. To truly understand the impact of suspensions, we must intersect the categories of service provision with race and ethnicity. The charts before you show our farms and special education enrollment by race and ethnicity. You'll recall that our farm suspension rate was 8.3%. Of all of our farm students, African American students represent the majority of students living in poverty at nearly 53% of all farm students. 76% of all farm students are students of color. 
Similarly, when we examine the suspension rate of our students with disabilities, which was 11.7%, we must be mindful that African American students also represent the majority of students identified as being in need of special education services at nearly 46%. Almost 62% of all students with disabilities are students of color. Therefore, the conclusion we make is that even when we look at our farms and special education suspension rates, we must still consider the disproportionate impact of suspensions on our African American students and other students of color. Now that we've shared the what of school climate in terms of what do our data say or show us, we want to talk briefly about the why. Why do our data show what they show? Annually, the Office of Research within the Department of Research, Accountability, and Assessment examines our stakeholder survey data and items to understand if those items remain valid and reliable and to understand the extent to which <coughs> items cluster together to form constructs or domains. These domains allow us additional insight beyond single questions and go beyond the what of the data to the why of the data. One of the domains that emerged from these analyses is called belonging. The belonging domain measures the extent to which students feel physically and emotionally safe at school. Items that come together, together excuse me, to form this domain address the overall school environment and climate and peer-to-peer -peer relationships. At the low end of the belonging domain and index, students experience and witness peer relationships and interactions that are characterized by unresolved conflict. They may find their school to be unsafe and not welcoming. At the high end of the belonging domain, students experience and witness peer relationships and interactions that are characterized by mutual respect. They perceive their school environment as safe and welcoming. The chart before you shows the belonging index by level of school. The belonging index can range from zero to 100. Higher scores on the belonging index correspond to higher levels of student comfort within the school environment and climate. Elementary students have a belonging index score of 63.9. Middle school students have a belonging index score of 48.5. And high school students have a belonging index score of 49.7. Students' sense of belonging varies by level of school. Please note that these numbers are not percentages, but rather index scores. Additional research into student belonging by the Office of Research has found that students' sense of belonging is lower in schools where there are larger proportions of students of color, where there are higher percentages of students living in poverty, and where there are higher suspension rates. We hypothesize that in these instances, students may not feel as if they or their culture are recognized and or reflected <coughs> in the school environment, instruction, supports, and or school setting, and that students don't feel as welcome or at home as we wish them to feel. This concludes the portion of our president, our, pre our president, our presentation on why our data show what they do. Doctors McComas, Wistead, and Martin Knox will now talk about the how and give me a break. <laughs> so here we go. So before you, um, we are returning to our conceptual framework for climate. Um, and in complement to this um, framework, every school within BCPS addresses school climate annually as part of our school progress plan. School progress plans within BCPS include just three sections, climate, literacy, or English language arts, and mathematics, allowing school teams to focus and refine their efforts over time. As a part of the school progress plan, schools analyze their data, they identify root cause patterns of um, root causes for data patterns, and then they identify strategic initiatives and key actions and professional learning that align um, to the school's comprehensive needs and are designed to improve and impact student outcomes. This process supports us in moving past surface level interpretations towards a deeper understanding of the systems at work. We recognize that addressing symptoms is a very different outcome than addressing root causes. During the 2016-2017 school year, climate was elevated in the school progress, uh, progress planning to be made the first section in the, that school teams address. And this was a purposeful shift, emphasizing the importance and impact that climate has on student achievement. The Multi-Tiered Systems of Support, or MTSS, is a framework to guide schools to provide a continuum of prevention and intervention services and supports. These supports are provided in a varying intensities based on the emotional and behavioral health needs of students. 
Implementing the framework of MTSS supports a positive and sustainable school climate. It provides a space where students, staff, and families feel socially, emotionally, and physically safe. Tier one is universal prevention, tier two is early intervention, and tier three is intensive intervention. Tier one required elements include positive behavior supports and social emotional learning programs. Tier two include group or individual supports. Tier three include a referral process and a crisis response plan. Schools can select from a menu of tier one, two, or three supports, and some are highlighted on the next few slides. Some examples of prevention include tier one or universal prevention supports. These supports are provided to all students. They include school-wide community building, such as restorative practices, positive behavior supports, or PBIS, and virtues language. Conscious discipline is an example that was implemented in our pre-K classrooms in 2016-17 and in kindergarten classrooms in 2017. BCPS engages with community partners. Currently, there are 190 mental health partners serving 126 schools within BCPS. Other partners include Department of Social Services, County Belize, our Maryland food banks, local universities, community volunteers, and mentoring programs. BCPS has been teaching youth mental health first aid in an effort to train staff to recognize when students are struggling emotionally and direct staff to appropriate resources. 1,052 staff are trained within 126 of our schools. Continuing with prevention includes tier two interventions such as personalized student success planning, which is the student support team within BCPS. Professional learning has been offered in best practices in classroom management to staff in 57 different schools. An additional training called the classroom checkup was provided to staff within 24 schools. The classroom checkup professional learning supports use the strategies outlined in the best practices training and staff are trained in the classroom checkup can implement the program within their own schools to provide consultation to classroom teachers. One resource at both of these trainings was the Positive Classroom Climate Tool for Look For Tool. It's a self-reflection tool that teachers can use to monitor classroom management and offers a checklist of additional strategies focused on prevention, positive relationships, and responsive student practices. Lastly, within prevention is Tier 3, or intensive interventions, which are offered to support students' emotional and behavioral health needs. This may require moving to individualized education planning or the IEP team. BCPS uses Crisis Prevention Institute, or CPI, and 979 of our staff are trained. This focuses on learning strategies to recognize when student behavior will elevate and prevent a situation which can escalate. Applied behavioral analysis is defined as a process of systematically applying interventions based on the principles of a learning theory and socially improve significant behaviors to a meaningful degree. Then demonstrate that the interventions used were responsible for, imp for improving that behavior. Data tracking and data analysis is critical part of ABA. There are 217 staff who have participated in training for these practices to address individual student behavior needs. In the category of restoration, we have to credit the International Institute of Restorative Practices. Schools implementing these practices may do so daily or in responsive circles. They use restorative questions to repair a relationship between the person who's been harmed and the one who's caused the harm, or they can use informal or formal conferences. This restorative justice approach encourages offenders to take responsibilities for their actions. New Zealand initiated implementing this in 1989 with their juvenile justice system. They implemented restorative justice and saw a plummeting of juvenile violence as well as arrests and incarceration rates. Restorative justice practices were then used in alternative school settings and finally in public school settings within the US and around the world. The research found that punitive methods are ineffective in reducing misconduct and may cause harm to students. A BCPS initiative focused on professional learning using the Maryland AWARE grant. Schools self-selected staff to be trained and pupil personnel workers as well as superintendents designees were trained.
The Office of Special Education offered training to all behavior interventionists and special educators in behavior learning support classrooms. Lastly, schools that have aligned restorative practices to their school progress plan used operating budget or Title I funds for professional learning and coaching. In accordance to policy and Rule 5550, all students and parents are advised through the Student Behavior Code, including the prohibited conduct and enumerated offenses outlined in the policy. At the beginning of every school year and throughout the school year, school administrators review the, and discuss the BCPS Student Handbook. During what is known as Handbook Talks, students are informed of their rights as well as behavioral expectations and consequences associated with inappropriate behaviors. Within the Student Handbook, there are three major categories of offenses that were described earlier by Dr. Adams, as well as a list of suggested interventions supports, and responses to student behavior. The intended purpose of the suggestions for administrators is to ensure student behaviors are addressed accordingly and to prevent behaviors from reoccurring. <coughs> There's also information contained in the handbook for our parents. The notification of parent rights is outlined in the student handbook pertinent to the student code of conduct, release of student directory information and records, confidentiality, videotaping on school property, and one card identification system, just to name a few. After the school administration addresses and reviews the handbook with our students, we ask that the handbook in the Student Conduct Code of Conduct is also discussed and reviewed by the parent with the student. Once reviewed, the student and the parent acknowledgement form is signed and returned to the appropriate school personnel. Finally, the student handbook also provides information regarding due process during student disciplinary actions. Throughout the investigative process, student information is protected under the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, also known as FERPA, which is the federal law that protects the privacy and the rights of all of our students, as well as their educational records. The handbook that was discussed is also available online throughout the entire school year. So in closing, I would just like to take an, a moment to note that we do appreciate the comments and considered feedback offered by our parents, our elected officials, and our other interested stakeholders during the last board's public hearing. We heard and we agree that it is important to understand the root causes of behavior and to respond adeptly to inappropriate behavior and to engage with parents every step of the way. Moving forward, BCPS staff will continue our work with the TAVCO Discipline Work Group to forge a path forward together, which supports healthy and safe school environments that are positive and productive for students and our faculty. So with that, I'll just echo um, Dr. McComas, and I just wanted just to reiterate that we have heard <laughs> our teachers, our parents, and community members about the importance of ensuring um, a positive school climate in every building, and th which is why climate has become a focal point and a priority for this administration. Um, so much so that we have uh, reallocated positions in order to create an office of school climate. And so we're just, uh, we're, we're proud of that. We're uh, proud of the intense focus this year on school climate. I want to thank also Drs. McComas, Adams, Wistead, and Martin Knox um, for their presentation. But I most importantly want to thank our teachers who are in classrooms with kids every single day, making sure that prevention is first through effective instruction. I know that our social workers and our counselors work very closely building those relationships with students, and our administrators have made climate a focal point as well by making sure that they're addressing school climate in their school progress plans, but making it an effort to um, put emphasis on school climate on a daily basis, reminding students of what um, a f what positive school climate means and what appropriate behavior means. Again, there is a myth out there that um, we're not addressing problematic behaviors. Hopefully what you've heard tonight is that our data suggests otherwise. So much so that many times we have to address some of the disparities that we're seeing in the data, and we know that we still have a lot of work to do. But with that, we'll take any questions that the board may have at this time. Um, on behalf of the board, I thank you all for your presentation. Thank you, Ms. White. Uh, questions or comments? 
Mr. Yulefelder. Several years ago, uh, during the uh, Dr. Harrison's uh, tenure, the same. Uh, sorry, uh, several years ago, under Dr. Harrison's uh, during his tenure as superintendent, uh, this exact situation was discussed. And in order to really understand the situation, um, now we use the word root cause. Dr. Hairston gave every board member two books. One was on civility, and the other was uh, on the creation or the migration uh, and how Baltimore County grew, called Not In My Neighborhood, mm -hmm. how bigotry uh, created what we have today. I have since then, uh, in my own mind, and I've spoken about it often, say there are two key elements. And these elements are really not quite the responsibility of the school system. Uh, kids have to come from an environment, two things, embrace an environment that embraces education and teaches civility. And I contend without those two components, we will always have problems with certain kids. And how you, how you change that, I don't know. But I still think there are two key elements uh, to um, behavior uh, in the school system. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I, I've spent a lot of time on the discipline policies and on the issue of school violence. And so I have some questions, a number of comments, and I will be uh, offering a motion as well. Uh, when the PRC was reviewing the discipline policies, I believe it was back in March or April, um, I had uh, put together a focus group of parents, teachers, and stakeholders from around the county. Uh, also, two of them were from the, the NAACP. And we reviewed the policies line by line. We made recommendations to the board. And uh, the response from the policy review committee was that Mr. Virch made a motion to hold a public input hearing on discipline. And I thank him for that. Um, I'm going to be submitting those recommendations again as the uh, PRC considers those policies again. But I did want to share some of the important points that came out of the focus group. Number one, the policies needed to be strengthened with more consistency. The more that's at the discretion of the school administration, the more consequences are applied inconsistently across the county. And some see the discretion as a way to push accountability away from the central office onto the school administration. Number two, race-based and IEP or special ed based discipline is creating a harmful double standard for discipline in BCPS. This double standard stems from fear of lawsuits and pressure from the central office to close the gap to meet state and federal guidelines. Number three, repeat offenses by a student are not being adequately taken into consideration in our policies. Number four, discipline issues are one of the top causes of teacher turnover. Number five, there is a problem with school administration not following existing policy and insufficient enforcement by the central office. Number six, conferences between school administration and teachers who refer students to the office are rarely ever held. Number seven, there is pressure on schools to avoid the dangerous school classification, which is defined as where 20% of students have been suspended that in that given year, which increases as the school year progresses. Number eight, students who are put in alternative programs are put back in the regular classroom too quickly. Number nine, while consequences are decreasing, behavior issues are increasing. There's an adverse relationship. Number 10, students prefer in-school suspension, which is served during instructional hours, over detention, which you normally think of as a lesser infraction, which is served outside of instructional hours. Number 11, teachers are not being supported by school level admin nor TABCO. Number 12, there is a lack of reporting and documentation of incidences by school level staff. 
13, there is a lack of availability of alternative programs. 14, there's a lack of staff to handle in-school suspensions or detention. 15, a general lack of consequences for students is snowballing the problem. 16, parents are not aware of the seriousness of the problem in our schools or how to properly handle discipline issues when they happen. And 17, discipline issues are a solvable problem that starts with the board. Uh, my first question then, you talked about and you gave a definition of disproportionality. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to clarify that, that the way that that is being interpreted by BCPS is when you're taking the percentage of uh, representation in a population. And so if, you know, a particular student group is 20 percent, then what you're saying is they should be 20 percent then of suspensions. And that is the definition. No, what we did is offer two different ways we can look at it. Uh, the State Department is currently working on a actual calculation called a risk ratio, um, which will look at um, the likelihood when I when we speak about the research saying that our African American students are three times as likely, they will establish risk ratio thresholds for different groups of students, um, and we will be determined to be disproportionate um, when the, when we exceed those risk ratios. In the absence of that formula, one of the ways we can look at it is by looking at students as a proportion of the population and a proportion of the students, and and then comparing the rates, which was the two ways that we showed you. We don't have the risk ratios formulas yet in order to be able to duplicate those in house to really understand it in the exact same way the state will be monitoring it. My understanding is they will, they will tr um, there will be an effort to be transparent around those formulas, so we'll be able to then model them and understand that moving forward. Okay, I appreciate that. I, I'm going to suggest another possible interpretation of that in just a moment. Um, another question, um, is there, because there was uh, federal guidelines that preceded the state guidelines. In 2014, there was a joint Dear Colleague let letter issued by the U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Ed. And, and I'm going to quote a, a sentence of that. Um, in that, it stated, the departments believe that guidance on how to identify, avoid, and remedy <coughs> discriminatory discipline will assist schools in providing all students with equal educational opportunities. So my question is, was there, uh, do, and you, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but was there federal grant money tied to that federal guidance? I do not have the answer to that. Mm. Okay. Um, also in your report, you stated that um, P0100 stresses that disparities between and among student groups are unacceptable which further drives BCPS's work to understand and address disproportionate disciplinary practices. Um, so I, I want to understand how you came to the conclusions that you had. Um, I, I mean, the, the goal here, ultimately, is that we treat students equally that we're not imposing a greater frequency or severity um, on any given student group based on demographics. I mean, I think we can all agree that that is the goal, is to be equal in our treatment of students. Um, does BCPS have reason to believe that discriminatory discipline is an issue in our system? That that teachers or administration is actually being discriminatory in their issuance of so, discipline. I just want to jump in here to say that, first of all, I think that there is a distinct dis uh, distinction between equity and equal. So there's a difference between equity and equality. And so equity takes into account what every student needs. And so that we are in a human business. We deal with human beings every single day. Every human being has a story. And so equity accounts for that story. And so we have to make sure that when we're treating kids equitably, that we're taking into account reasonable consequences, logical consequences that are based on that human story. And so when you, uh, when you apply discipline, for instance, equally, it may not necessarily take into account that child's story. 
So we, we, what you're saying about the policy 100 in terms of that equity policy, I think what you're saying is that we have a greater need um, to champion our equity work that we're doing so that we can make sure that all kids are um, treated equitably. Well, I appreciate that answer. That, that's not what I asked, nor what I was trying to say. But I am asking, does BCPS have a reason to believe that discriminatory discipline is an issue in our system? I think the data speaks for itself in terms of we have disparities in our data that we need to identify. So it's not just necessarily being um, applying one reason over another, but we do have an issue when we're looking at the disparities in our data, and so that we that we absolutely have to address. Race could be one issue, but it also could be gender, could also be um, sexual orientation, could also be all those other factors that are in, in policy 100. Well, that kind of brings me to what I was going to suggest as an alternative interpretation of disparity. Um, if discipline disparities are in alignment with behavioral incidences, two separate things, there's discipline that is a response of a behavior. Um, if, they're, if they're in alignment with the behavioral incidences among student groups, then those disparities are actually appropriate. So if one student group has a certain percentage of the behaviors, let's say 20% of the behaviors, and 20% of the suspensions are given to that student group, then that is appropriate regardless of how much that student group represents in the population. They might be 8% of the population. But if they're committing 20% of the behaviors, then it is appropriate that they should get 20% of the suspensions. And I think that's what Dr. Adams said that the state education department is working on, those right. kind of analyses. Correct. Well, I'm not sure that that's what they're, how they're going to define it. I, I would be very interested in that. Um, so I, what I'm saying is, we need to address the underlying causes of the behavioral problems, not address the discipline. The discipline is not the problem. Uh, um, the discipline administration is not the problem. The behavior is the problem. So let's not confuse what our target is. Um, we cannot make the assumption that these disparities are due to discriminatory practices unless we have evidence of that. For instance, we know that socioeconomic status affects student behavior. So why is it not also to be expected that discipline assignment should be in alignment with that? Or let's say the special ed category. A lot of our special ed students have behavior issues. So you would expect more behavior problems in that to be represented by that group. So again, it should be in alignment with the behavior. Um, we don't question disciplinary disparities between the sexes. I haven't seen any of that. Even though I believe that there's a greater disparity with the sexes than with racial groups. We don't assume that boys are disciplined more than girls due to sexism. If we made that assumption and it was false, it would be detrimental to our schools to encourage them to equalize that disparity, to say, we gotta make sure we're suspending girls as much as we are as boys. That would be a really harmful thing to our school system. So we gotta make sure that if we're gonna make that recommendation, that it is actually in line with behavior problems. Let me just interrupt for a second. I'm, I'm going to ask you how long you're going to be because I think there are others. Almost that, done. Oh, okay. Yes, I think. So I, I just wanted I just wanted to add though that I think that the presentation we heard uh, discussed both discipline and disparities, and I think that you are raising questions that are inconsistent with the presentation. It's okay for you to say what you're saying, but I don't think that you should superimpose your perspective on what the presentation was. Well, I. I Disagree. Um, I, I don't. Th I think that this is absolutely in line. Okay. Just continue um, then. And I'm almost done. Thank you very much. Um, so this issue should be of particular concern to our student member, as the report says. Students have stated that bullying is a bigger issue than school administrators realize. 
What that says to me is that there are behavioral incidences that are not being reported to school administration. Um, I do have a motion, but if you want me to hold it and you can, we can have other discussion. May I respond? Yeah, yes, please. please. Um, a, a few things. I think, uh, I think we should be clear that no staff member used the term discriminatory practices. That is not what we said. Um, what we said is that we have differences, we have gaps, and that according to our equity policy, we are to address whenever we see gaps because we don't believe, the board does not believe based on its policy that gaps should exist. Um, in terms of the discrepancy between what students feel and what administrators feel, what we said was that we believe that students should report, and certainly I understand that students may be afraid to report. I have two children, and I know that they've had incidences where they did not feel comfortable reporting things, even with a dad who worked in the school system. Um, at the same time, I understand from being a school administrator that you have to hold all the evidence to a high standard, and that you may have 100 reports, and when you investigate them, you may only find that 30 of them raised to the level that meets the definition. and so. Our understanding is that as when we speak to administrators, they're coming from the perspective of when I think about bullying, I think about the definition and how many of my investigations led to meeting the standard of the definition. Where a student, <coughs> I tease Dr. Martin Knox about this all the time in meetings, she cuts me a look and I think, oh, there she is, teasing me, bullying me again, I'm being bullied, help me, <laughs> superintendent. Um, but I think there's that difference, and we want to honor that students are not feeling comfortable, and we want to also honor that administrators have a process that they have to go through to investigate and hold, those inform hold that information to a standard in order to then say, this was bullying, it must be addressed, excuse me, in a particular way. So I just want to be clear that we were not, it was not our impl my implication that, you know, somehow Im administrators aren't addressing this or it's not being realized is that they are addressing it because they're required to. I was required to. Everybody up here has been a school administrator. We were all required to. Is that when you do that and it doesn't meet the standard, you can't call it bullying. I just have to echo what Dr. Adams just said in terms of what our principals and assistant principals are required to do. So when the, there is an incident, they are required to investigate the incident. They are required then to also contact the parents. They are required to then administer discipline if, if warranted um, according to the categories that are outlined in the Student Behavior Handbook. That is what they are required to do. And I know that our principals work very, very diligently um, every single day to hear those cases and to make sure. Now, again, if there are specific incidents and our parents do give us a call so that when those, um, when it, they, they don't feel like their issues have been heard, there is a mechanism for and a process for that so that they can be heard as well. Um, but our principals work very diligently every day just to make sure that those cases are heard and addressed appropriately. Do Thank others on that. the board have questions or comments? I have a comment. Um, I, I, th I think what Ann said, one of the things uh, um, that there probably is some disparity in the way um, issues are resolved. We have nine yeah, yeah. things. There probably are some disparities in the way things are resolved by perhaps at the teacher level because we've got 9,000 teachers and all 9,000 teachers don't think alike. Teachers, as we all do, have prejudices and biases. And I'm sure that in everything that we do as individuals in our work and in our, our friendships and relationships, biases do come out sometimes. So let's not be naive to believe that there is a certain consistency always. I think it just depends on the situation and the person involved in the situation and what that person's personality biases or prejudices may be. That's part of human nature, and I don't think we'll ever overcome that. Well, and I think that actually supports what came out of the focus group that said there's inconsistency when we give school administration more leeway. So we really need to strengthen those policies. Um, all of them say you may, you know, this, this consequence may be given rather than it will be given. Um, so they, they could not give any consequence. It, that's how much discretion there is. Okay, so, um, so bef before Dr. McComas speaks, just want to make clear that you're speaking of a focus group and it's something that didn't involve the rest of this board. I wasn't involved. It was something that you did on your own. 
Um, uh, Dr. McComas, you had a comment? I, I was going to offer up, um, as someone who has personally engaged in school climate and, and supporting student behavior, um, it is important for us to understand that consistency and being identical are not the same. I can hold a student to a consistent level of expectation, and when I understand their circumstances, and I, I will share a student situation um, that I personally handled uh, at one point in my career as a school administrator, where if I had, if I had been dictated to how to, to provide discipline to that student, that student not only would have been put out of um, their schooling, they would have gone home to what I knew was an abusive situation. And so I was able, and it was in a different district, I was able to exercise discretion to provide meaningful consequences for that student that did lead to a change in behavior. And so I offer up that being consistent in our expectations does not necessarily um, equate to an identical consequence. We use the expression logical consequences and I will share with you that what changes behavior is meaningful consequences. May and I, I just uh, offer that okay. up. May I ask a kind of a general question and that is how the information you have about our school system uh, differs or if you have resources to say whether it differs from other Maryland jurisdictions or some other national standards. Sure. Um, I have uh, a report that was published by the State Department uh, November of 2016, was Maryland. the most recent Maryland okay. data. So I looked at a couple of the school districts now, keeping in mind, as our evaluators from Johns Hopkins have told us, there is no other school district in our state that is the size of ours with the level of diversity and the level of poverty. So we either find districts that are about our size and they're less diverse or and less um, impoverished, or we find districts that are near us a little bit smaller and they're less diverse and more impoverished. So there's you know, not a um, direct uh, matched um, comparison that we can make. Um, for the 15-16 school year, where Baltimore County had at, in that school year um, roughly 7,600 suspension incidents, uh, Baltimore City had 8,445, I'm sorry, excuse me, 15-16 school year, let me not make, make a mistake here, where we had 8,445 incidents. Baltimore City had 9,121. When you're, well, I'm gonna interrupt. When you say incidents, you're talking about suspensions. You're not talking about behavior incidences. Yes, I'm talking about susp suspension incidents. And in our presentation, never did we talk about behavior referrals. We talked about suspension incidents and suspension rates. That is correct. That is what is captured by the state. The state does not capture and or report or publish uh, behavior referrals at the school building level. Um, so Baltimore BCPS had 8,445 incidents. Baltimore City had 9,121 incidents. Anne Arundel County had 7,221 incidents. Prince George's County had 12,310 incidents. Howard County had 2,360 incidents. Okay, and then one more question. I'm not sure if anyone else has any more questions, but we heard Ms. Baton and you heard her this evening talk about how TABCO, I think, had perhaps different perspectives on what to do or how to handle things. And I know that you all have been at the table together. Are there things that you're still talking about? Is, where is the process there? So uh, since Dr. McComas and I have been in our current position, we've had the opportunity formally to meet with Ms. Baton and her team once, and there are, for, there are additional meetings on the calendar and scheduled. Now, of course, we see her during the course of the week, and she has her cell phone number, so we're in contact with her all the time, but it is our um, pleasure to be working with the TABCO Discipline Work Group on an ongoing basis. Good. All right, other questions or comments? Mrs. Miller. Oh, let's go with Mr. M Mr. McDaniels first. Um, I, I just wanted to say uh, um, I'm not of the perception that uh, everything is okay and the status quo is where we want to be. I think um, we're addressing this so that we can move forward in a positive manner. I just wanted to make sure um, that I understand the presentation that was made. Uh, in terms of there being lack of consequences, if I understood the data that you presented, it appeared that in the last three years, our, our suspension numbers have actually increased. Correct. And that doesn't seem to be consistent with the whole notion that there are no consequences. And, and I just wanted to make sure I didn't mishear that part of it. That is the, correct. The, Incidents the, are up. 
and the other um, thing that came to mind when we see how our population has changed over the last 30 years, we see uh, a, a much increased, 119%, uh, I think you said, increase mm -hmm. in our farms percentage. A lot of those kids probably over the 30 years came to school hungry. Um, I think in the 30 years we've we've done things to to help ameliorate that to a certain extent by feeding some of them. But if they're hungry, if they hadn't been fed, that could also lead to uh, disruption in the classroom and lack of paying attention and things like that. So when we talk about I guess getting to the root cause and being proactive, things like understanding how our kids come to school um, seems to be uh, a big part of what we, what we want to do. And I guess um, to follow up with, with Mitz, what Mr. Gillis said, you're working with TABCO and understanding what goes on in the classroom, but I guess we all need to work together in terms of developing our policies so that we're all trying to move forward. Um, again, I, I don't want to give anybody the impression that we think, uh, any of the board thinks that we're okay as we are. We do need to, to be progressive and move forward, but I think we just need to work as a team to figure out what those things really need to be. Thank you. Mrs. Hinn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I understand it, when we speak to school climate, we're not referring to only the classroom, but also the student's entire experience within BCPS. And one concern frequently um, raised by the community is school bus um, behavior and issues that occur there. Um, while this framework seems very classroom-centric, which is probably appropriate, I'm curious as to the supports that are in place or that are planned to be in place to assist our drivers, to assist students in promoting um, ideal behaviors on the bus. And I, I would reason that expectations are set by what is condoned or what is allowed on the buses each day, and that does affect a large percentage of our student population. And I'm curious if you can speak to how, what you've presented tonight, and thank you for this presentation, how does that translate to our transportation office, and is there coordination, or can you speak to that? I can speak to. Um, we are in the process of building out a professional development opportunity for our bus drivers. You know, when we think about the, the training that goes into a classroom teacher, they have years of professional training. Um, and even given that, human behavior is very complex. It's not simple. Um, and so we recognize that we need to provide organizational support and professional development for our bus drivers in, in terms of helping with that, right? Because Again, understanding human behavior is not just a, a knee-jerk reaction. If we're, we're in it to help change behavior and help teach students uh, how to encounter situations more productively in the future, there's a lot that goes into that. So uh, Mr. Burke and uh, Mr. Uh, Smith and I are in the process of building out a professional development opportunity. And just to speak specifically from when I was a school administrator, it's something that I took on based on the referrals that were coming in for behaviors on the bus. So uh, my staff and I had determined that and we built in a series of, you know, having them in. They came in to see the kids in the classroom. We built opportunities where they um, attempted to interact with each other so they could build relationships as we are able to do in classrooms and they're not often able to do on the bus. We gave them um, opportunities to talk about scenarios that were happening on the bus and ways to respond more appropriately so that the ride would be safe and everyone would be delivered home. So I, I believe that multiple administrators sometimes take it on based on specific incidents that are happening and referrals that are coming in. And I was also going to add, um, before Dr. Wisted uh, took some of my words, um, but I was going to share that there is a mechanism that's in place currently for our drivers to use. Um, just because the information that we've spoke of seems like it's just for inside the schoolhouse, it's what we call portal to portal or the school scope of authority. So whether a student is walking to and from home in school or whether he or she is on the bus, they are expected to maintain appropriate behaviors 
wherever they are. Um, so most of our schools have what we call codes of conduct. They're applicable in the classroom, in the hallway, in the cafeteria, on the bus, on the playground. Um, and that information is reiterated to students on a daily basis or regularly or as needed. Um, so the handbook not only applies to in school, but it r applies for our scope of authority, which is from the time they leave home until the time they return back to home. So I just wanted you to know that there is a mechanism for our drivers to utilize. Um, and the referrals are oftentimes given to the school administrators. There's usually a designated administrator um, that hears and sees referrals and takes actions accordingly. Thank you. And, and what we have frequently heard is that those supports are not available to our drivers. So I definitely see that as an area or for opportunity to continue because as you all know, consistency is key. Mm -hmm. And if we are to set that expectation, it's important that we're consistent, as you said, Dr. Martin Knox, no matter where that occurs. So thank you. Mrs. Causey and then Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I do want to thank our interim superintendent, Verlita White, for having this discussion and also for having the board hearing that preceded this and for having as one of her two renewed focuses this year is school climate along with literacy. And I believe that just having that focus, having starting the conversation and starting the understanding of um, some real numbers is going to be helpful. Um, I, with that said, I would like to say that the information is helpful and I think it is important to understand, as you said, to honor the difference between the student's perception of what's happening at their school that then uh, translates into this belonging index because mm -hmm. we would really want a higher average than yeah. what we're seeing, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, and also the disconnect with the parents because what is it that's happening in the student's day that that's not being translated into the home environment where the parents or the family, whoever, um, could be more supportive of that student in what their experience is and maybe bring that up to a teacher's attention and then try and develop a, a better atmosphere that the students feel is a better atmosphere. Um, also, I'm curious, and I'd, I'd like some follow-up, uh, Ms. White, if you um, can do this. When we're talking <coughs> about incident numbers, and um, as Ms. Miller pointed out, the incident numbers that uh, you're talking here are the the behaviors that come to suspension. Yes. But then there are behavior incidents that don't end in suspension. Mm -hmm. So um, what I think would be relevant is to understand what are the behavior incidents that are happening, happening, the number, and then how many of those translate into suspensions. Because if the behaviors are up by 100% over three mm -hmm. years, but the suspensions are only up by 10%, then we're still doing a lot of intervention before we get to suspensions. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing if it's working. Um, but what we also want to see is that the behavioral, the incidence of misbehavior is coming down, either through restorative justice, through more education, through more prevention. Um, because right now, you could come back with incident numbers next year, and we wouldn't know which way the trend is going. Just if suspensions are down, we don't know what the climate is in the building with the actual number of misbehavior issues. Mm -hmm. So I think what would be important to understand is to see the correlation of the behavior incidents and then how many end up in suspension. So that would be important to understand. The other thing is that um, not just incident numbers alone, but incident numbers related as per capita, per student population. So how many students in the high school? Because as our enrollment is increasing, if incidents are increasing, the trend may still be on a good path. Do you see what I'm yes, saying? I, I as understand long as what it's at saying. a decreasing mm -hmm. ratio. So pure incident numbers are not sufficient for the board or the community or the parents or the teachers even to understand what the trends are. What we need to understand is the per capita incidents, both for the actual misbehaviors that are happening and those that result in the suspension. The other thing that I'd like to see some real conversation around is uh, solutions for those situations that we know can help cause misbehaviors, which are overcrowding. If you have a teacher that is responsible for more students in a classroom, it will be harder for them to know that student's story <coughs> and to understand how they might give that meaningful consequence if they don't have the time to understand that child's story. So we really need to get to the crux of these increasing class sizes. As our TABCO uh, president pointed out, the increasing responsibilities that our teachers bear. Um, and 
also the, the initiatives that we have. We need to evaluate what is really being effective to help the teachers teach and to help the, the students learn. Um, if we're having uh, severe technology problems, we need to understand that. I mean, and wrap our arms around a solution. Um, one of the things, one of the other things that we can consider um, is additional recess time. Um, I know as a parent, if you have a child that's having a hard time to settle down and it's getting close to recess time, you don't ask them to continue to try and sit still, but you get to the recess time where they can get out in the fresh air in some unstructured time, interact with their peers, and literally get their wiggles out. That's what I like to call it. <laughs> so maybe that's, I mean, yes. Yeah, no, so maybe that's something we need to consider request. because right now we're at a 20 minute per day. Mm -hmm. You know, let's look at that because that might not be sufficient, especially for a population where, in general, all our culture is uh, allowing for more sedentary activities rather than a lot of activity. And developmentally, we know that that's not the, the healthiest choice for our students or for adults. Um, one thing we can consider um, is how much screen time are our students experiencing, okay? Is that an issue? And do we need less screen time? The first thing is going to be to understand how much screen time are the students having, okay? And if they're having screen time that's trying to deal with a broken device, that's obviously going to be frustrating, and that's not going to be um, a, a good circumstance for the student to be in. And also, as was pointed out, having more time for direct student engagement so that they can learn those social-emotional skills that will help to uh, prevent escalating um, situations. So I would, um, and one of the initiatives that, um, that happened in November of 2013 is um, that increased the teacher workloads is the former superintendent removed the highly successful seven period day schedule from 11 of our top performing high schools, um, including in my district, Delaney, Lock Raven, um, Towson was in there. And what the result of that was, um, and this was from a consultant that was hired by the um, school system, that it was a return on investment, a savings of over $5 million per year to the school system but it increased those teachers at the high school level from teaching five classes to teaching six. So you can see that's a dramatic increase in teacher workload. Um, additionally, one other point is, that has come up as we've been evaluating the calendar, and I appreciate the staff uh, really giving a more thorough analysis this year, is that we have the shortest school day in the county. So literally, our teachers are doing more in less time when you consider how well prepared um, many of our students are. Our teachers are working very, very hard. And that's something to look at. And what I was told when I first came on the board um, and brought that up as an issue is, oh, well, that's going to cost us, you know, I think it might have been $7 million a year. Okay, well, is $7 million a year worth teachers having the time to know that student's story, to be able to learn what is a meaningful consequence, I think those are things we need to evaluate. What is going to help our teachers teach and our students learn in a school climate where they can feel they belong, where they can feel that it's productive for them to be there? So that was a lot of information, and I will um, like to hear your response, but I would also <laughs> like to hear a commitment to the board getting more meaningful information along per capita, Lines so we can see trends. Um, and also, I would want to see um, specific data when we talk about um, incidents with weapons. What, what are those weapons, whether it's knives or firearms, and how the trends are relating to that? Because I think that that's important for us to know in, in trying to keep students safe. Ms. Causey, I do, um, Dr. Wisted just today was able to pull some referral data. Um, so I do, she had that sort of in her, in her back pocket. I didn't know that. Um, so thank you, and Melissa. Um, one of the things I want to be clear on with these data is we've not attempted to work with Dr. Brown or with Mr. Brown to try to connect Renard being referred led to Renard being suspended or not. Like, so this is just, these are just numbers um, at this point. In the 14-15 um, school year, um, we had, a, a total number of 32,643 referrals. Um, and that increased in this last school year, 16, 17, to 34,846. Um, so we could certainly, if it is Madam Superintendent's 
direction, well, do some I, analyses you know, I around that. that. I just want us to be, um, I want to make sure that when we're looking at correlations that we're doing so absolutely um, um, effectively, thoroughly, and uh, a accurately. So for instance, the number, we can't just necessarily look at the num number of incidents. We have more kids. We have more kids now than we had before. So if you're just mm. looking at the, the number of incidents, um, you can't just look at those number of incidents when we have more children to account for. So again, uh, the correlation um, um, and looking at any type of research design around that would have to be accurate and we'd have to do so with effective methodology. I'd also just like to say that we promote effective instruction. So um, when we're looking at all of the factors that are involved in schooling and in involved in um, pedagogy, Pedagogy, meaning that uh, we teach the whole child. A, a pedagogue is one who teaches the whole child, right? So when we're looking at it, it's different than schooling. Schooling is just coming to school to get your ABCs, one, two, threes. Pedagogy means you're teaching the entire child. And so I want to just congratulate our teachers for doing so every single day. They do not have necessarily a prescription, nor should they, because they're dealing with individual students. Their first line of defense is effective instruction, engaging instruction. We agree that there should be downtime. So when you're looking at recess, that should be device-free um, time for kids to wiggle, move, play, <laughs> and move their bodies. We believe in balanced instruction, where kids are working not only accessing resources online, they're using paper, pencil, they're working with their teacher, they have one-on-one -on -one instruction, they have whole group instruction. It's about balance, but our teachers, um, who deliberately work in the art and science of teaching, know how to craft and design effect effective instruction to make sure that there is that balance. And our principals oversee that process. I'm proud of our teachers and I'm proud of our um, parents. Um, I do take exception with those who try to frame our schools as bad schools. We have out outstanding kids. Um, I was with our kids today and we have wonderful children. We do have exceptions and we do have some intense work to do that we we've presented very transparently tonight. Our work is not done. We're dealing with the human condition, so our work will never be done. And so we're really um, committed to that work to make sure that when um, our students are engaging in problematic behavior, that we're holding them accountable for that. As a parent, I don't send my, child, my children to school to be hit or kicked or bitten um, or scratched. But I am, I'm making sure, though, that as the superintendent of this school system, that we have consequences to address those kinds of behaviors, and we have a way to restore our children so that they can redeem themselves and that they can learn and we can teach problem at how to uh, teach acceptable behaviors, which is part of the p overall pedagogy. Mr. Young. Dr. Adams, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier that there may be, um, I think you said like 100 incidences and only 30 of those rise to meet the criteria. The other 70, what, what happens there um, for those students who actually said, hey, I had this, this issue. Does, does the principal follow back up with them and try to have a conversation and explain while not discounting their, their feelings or their perception? I would defer to Dr. Martin Knox. I mean, I could tell you what I did, but I wasn't a principal yesterday, okay. right? So, Stop. So, so one of the things that I applaud our system for doing is ramping up our efforts so that students have a venue to communicate what's transpiring. So we've begun with having our anti-bullying day to extending it to a week. Um, we actually have our, our language out in our schools. If you see something, say something. But the mechanism that students utilize is the harassment and intimidation form that is one that is uh, driven by Maryland State Department of Education. When that information isn't investigated by our principals, the information is not discounted. It may not rise to the level of bullying, but it has risen to the point to make the child feel uncomfortable. So whether it's our school counselors who are addressing the needs of the students or the administrators addressing the needs of our students, if a student reports an incident, it is investigated, it is taken seriously, and it is addressed. Thank you. Also, um, something that I believe is powerful about restorative practices is that um, when students are in conference together, the person who's been harmed, you know, is given a voice. So they're able to talk through with the person who's done the harm what's happened. Um, and, and that's something that hasn't been a practice in the past. And, and overall, with student behavior, I think what we're learning is the direct 
removal without bringing students back together and, and talking about what the issue is between students and students, students and adults, adults with adults, um, hasn't changed behavior. So we're looking to a way to bring people together and build a community because at some point the children do need to come back and, and do need to return and, and we need to make it a safe and healthy environment for everyone. Mr. Virch. I didn't uh, indicate oh. anything. Right. <laughs> I thought you, I thought you I can indicate that. I don't know. No, no, no. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say that Ms. Causey did participate in that focus group with me, and we also had invited the former chair of the PRC, and she was not able to attend. Um, I wanted to respond to Ms. White's uh, point about equity in consequences or in discipline. Um, and, and I would like to suggest that uh, the equity shouldn't be in the consequence itself. The consequence should be equal for all students, should have the same consequence for an infraction. The equity comes into play in the supports and interventions that we back the, you know, these policies up with. So. They should, there should be consistent consequences. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that we, what I'm hearing here is an assumption of that, that we are, um, that there is discriminatory uh, practice here. And, um, and I think we really need to have some evidence of that and more data to make sure that we're making the right decision. If we're building all of this upon a false assumption, that could be, that could really lead our system astray. So what happens when we apply equity to a consequence is we create a double standard for discipline where certain student groups know they can get away with behaviors while the victims learn not to speak up about problems because they know there will be no consequences and it will just make matters themselves. So it's a problem that snowballs. Um, so my que another question I have is, has there been any study on disparities in behavioral incidences among student groups? Do we have data? Uh, we certainly could intersect uh, categorical offenses by demographics, uh, but we did not do that in advance of this report. Yeah, and, and, I'm, and just to be clear, I'm not saying the discipline, I'm saying the reporting of incidences, so referrals, I guess, is how you refer to them. Those are captured in our student information system, so those are data we could examine. Um, and the reason I think that that's important um, again is if the if the system is doing something wrong here and applying bias or for whatever reason applying discipline you know creating these disparities in a way that's inappropriate that's very harmful and we should address that i agree but if we're making a faulty assumption and we're not looking at does it match the incidences of the behaviors so, so then we're trying to correct a problem that doesn't even, potentially doesn't exist. That is really harmful too, in, in the way I've already described it. So, so I do want to make my motion then, and that is to direct that a study be conducted on disparities between student groups in behavioral incidences. That means. I don't, I don't, I don't understand know what that means. What that means. You mean an example? I, don't, I really don't understand what you're saying. You're asking. I'm asking that they conduct a study. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure how to say it another way. They just gave us a study. Okay, I, I understand the study part, but I don't understand what you want to study of. Between student groups what in discipline. Of? I'm asking that we have a study between, on disparities between student groups in the behavioral incidences. 
What do you mean by student groups? I, mean, I don't understand. Can you define You're talking about groups? races All and socioeconomics? All of the groups that they have same, in this report. You're talking about the same So breakdown. I'm saying give us this report again, not on discipline, but on the behavioral incidences, because that's how we can judge and see do incidences, behavioral incidences match the discipline that's being doled out, or is there actually a disparity? Well, how do we know what discipline is being doled out? We don't. We just had a whole report on it. I know how, what the discipline is. Dr. Adams you just said they. You always talk about suspensions. Suspension. Dr. Adams said they just just said they have that information in the student information system. I mean, if what you're asking for is an additional report, I think is. Um, I I talked I talked about and and Mrs. White talked about is the real information to allow us to understand trends is the per capita. Right. So we have some increasing categories, we have some decreasing categories, but as, as we have all said, we have increasing enrollment. So the valid information is the per capita information and also the incidence of misbehavior versus suspensions because we've got to start to see the correlation of the whole issue because it's not just to um, increase suspensions or decrease suspensions, it's to improve behavior in the school. And we need to understand where the trends are in that direction, and is there a correlation in how we're approaching it? You know, and if there's any data around schools that have restorative justice and how long they've been doing that and, and improvements in behavior, that's fantastic. That's what we need to know, because then we need to apply the resources of the school more appropriately to the strategies that are working for our students and working for our teachers. Mrs. Hen. Can yes. I offer one clarification? I'm sorry. Um, I want to be clear. I think I may have misspoke. What we have in the student information system are referrals that are made to the office. Those would not include all of the disciplinary behaviors that students exhibit, because just as administrators have discretion in whether and how they apply consequences, as a teacher, I had discretion into whether I handled a disciplinary action within my classroom and never notified my administration, or whether I did, in fact, refer the student to the office. So I just want to be clear that those data, again, don't give us everything and every behavior that's occurring in the school. So, and I, just and to I, clarify I think that we're that. actually ahead of the game when it comes to um, looking at a study. Dr. Brown, if you could just come forward for a second to talk about, um, we've just contracted, I believe, with AIR, correct, to get underneath some of these uh, uh, requests. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. She faked me off. <laughs> <laughs> he said absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I. I admire the, the report that they've done tonight. They've gathered a lot of information. We did, however, uh, and the board approved the contract uh, for an independent external evaluation, which would definitely get at the per capita piece and would also involve um, getting feedback from our, our teachers and, and our principals as well. So it's a systemic, external, independent uh, report that I think will get at many of the issues that are being brought up today. And when will we be able to launch? We are working on the scope of work for that contract as we speak. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Hen. Yes, and, and that report um, that Dr. Brown mentioned may answer the questions that, that the board has raised. I would support the motion for a report that looks at the number of referrals um, as a measure of our progress toward, um, or as a measure of the effectiveness of these initiatives that you presented tonight. Because as Ms. Causey was saying, the goal is to reduce the behavioral incidents, um, not necessarily the, the associated disciplinary consequences. Is um, that a second of Mrs. Miller's motion? I would motion? second Mrs. Miller's motion. All right. Any, I, I would just only suggest that I'm not sure if that's uh, necessary, given that right. you've already approved the sure. contract and the study will already be on. Yeah, it I would way. suggest uh, in discussion on the motion that we let this um, uh, third party analysis occur and see what it delivers before we try to direct our staff to uh, do perhaps uh, double work on things that are already being done. Well, let me respond to that. I mean, if we pass this motion, if that contract fulfills it, then it's done. So, and if it doesn't, then we take the next steps required to fulfill it. So let me just restate my motion because for whatever reason there seemed to be confusion on it. So my motion is to direct that a study be conducted 
on comparisons of behavioral <coughs> incidences between student groups, including race and special education status groups. Is anyone interested in tabling that motion until the study is done? I move we table it. All right, is there a second to that? Second. There's a motion and a second to table that motion. Um, discussion on the tabling. The value of the tabling is there's no study now, there's a contract for a study coming, and even the movement of the underlying motion said, well then, if this doesn't do it, we then can take the next step. This allows that to occur. Mrs. Hen. As we understand it tonight, the data exists. I don't think we're asking for a duplication of effort, but more so to change the denominator in the analysis that's already been presented to us. Okay. All right, Mrs. Miller. Uh, the tabling does not allow it to occur. That's the point. Um, if we pass the motion, that allows it to occur. So if, if the study that's being conducted does not answer the question, this motion then allows us to proceed. Tabling it would require a whole nother discussion, a whole nother round, another motion. Mr. Virch. Thank you ever so much. Um, the plain fact is that's whether the information exists or it doesn't, <coughs> there is the value of an external entity conducting the study. So then there is no suggestion that there were other hands that may have stirred the pot. There may have been folks who were intimidated to interact with anyone else. This allows for what everyone wants, an analysis, or as our superintendent said, to get underneath of this data. Anyone on, any other comment on the motion to table? All in favor of the motion to table, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the motion carries. All right. Um, Next on our agenda, I think Mrs. Causey. I would just ask the superintendent if she would uh, entertain a meeting with um, a few board members to just talk about the scope. Um, it would be more helpful, I believe, to make sure ahead of the research um, that it's information that the board feels will be helpful to the work in general of our analysis of programs and practices that will help the teachers. Certainly. Thank you. Mr. Birch. Uh, as I understand it, um, the member belongs to the contracts committee. I see nothing untoward about having a conversation with our superintendent to make sure that this study is going to get us what we want underneath of this data. Very good. I want to thank all of you for your presentation. I want to thank Mrs. White for putting this together. Um, I think it's been beneficial to the board. It's not over, um, and it's an ongoing process, and I look forward, as does the whole board, to uh, making progress on this important matter. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Next on our agenda is committee updates. That's item J. Um, and Mr. Yulfer, audit committee. Yes, the uh, internal audit committee met. Uh, we met with our um, external auditors who have audited the system. And the report will be given November, I believe, the first November meeting. Very good. Um, Mr. McDaniels, is there any building and contracts committee report? No, I have a curriculum committee. Report. Okay, well, next is curriculum. Um, we uh, had our last curriculum committee meeting on uh, October 19th, where we had a very robust discussion about blended learning. Um, some of the concepts that are, that are at the foundation of the blended learning approach were communicated to the committee, and that was very um, helpful to us. Um, our next meeting is going to be Thursday, November 16th. Very good. Uh, Mrs. Miller, digital safety? Um, we haven't met since the last update, but I'll just say that um, there are a number of outstanding questions and, and requests for information that uh, have not been addressed yet. Uh, and there was discussion at the last meeting that we would be getting information between meetings, but so far I have not gotten so much as a response to my last request. 
Very good. Mr. Virch, PRC. Um, the uh, very diligent members of uh, the Policy Review Committee met on the 16th. Policies looked at by our um, very diligent uh, uh, committee members uh, will come for first reading on the board's November 21st agenda. Um, the Policy Review Committee's next scheduled meeting is November 13th. The agenda and documents will be posted on the board committee's webpage prior to the meeting. All right, the uh, next board meeting is Tuesday, November 7th at 6.30. We're adjourned.